Shall we pray? Father, as we open your word, speak, O blessed Master. Have mercy this one more time on this feeble lump of clay and use it this one more time for your glory. I pray in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. I must say that I'm really fascinated with your building. Uh, you know, I, there, there's just so much, uh, you know, uh, Jewish symbolism in here. And I looked up and I said, wow, that's the forerunner. That's the root of Christianity. That's the root of our faith. We can't, and every Sabbath, every time you come into this place, you recognize that. Oh, what a beautiful edifice you worship your God in. I also would like to say that it's, it's good to meet Elder Malcolm. You know, I heard the name, and, and uh, I have not met too many Malcolms in my travels in the world. And so I said, as long as your name is Malcolm and you're from Jamaica and you're not too tall, we're related. <laughs> we are related. It's just that gene pool that, that we have. But I want to direct your attention to, to this passage in, in Revelation chapter 7 that was so ably read for our scripture reading. And John on the Isle of Patmos had this vision, and, and sisters and brothers, friends, most of us, if not all of us, uh, that are sitting up in church here today will remember that even though we have some tough times in life, that life is not always tough times. We have had some good times. There's some incredibly good times, some marvelous moments. In, in a real sense, we have been there when the times were so good as like the disciples that were up on the mountain with Jesus when Peter just wanted to say, let the good time roll on. Shall we build three tabernacles and just live up here for the rest of our lives? Good times. When you didn't have to worry about anything. Good times when you were prospering and in good health when your blood pressure was 120 over 70. Help me, Holy Ghost. And your glucose level was 80. You had all your five senses and 20-20 vision and all 32 teeth. Uh, ladies, your vital statistics were 36, 24, 26. Help me, Holy Ghost, or 36. Good times when there were some birthdays, so exciting, some graduations inspiring, and, and, and some weddings, and some, just some good times in life. When your adrenaline was so pumped, and you were so happy that you could sing because you were happy. Sing because you were free. For somebody said, his eyes are on the sparrow. I know he watches me. Well, some people, when, when, when they think of New York, they think that, oh man, going to that city is just so congested and all the crime and violence that happens in New York. But there are good things happening in New York. New York is an exciting city to be in. I came in last night. I was pumped. I couldn't even sleep. This city just had me going. I said, wow, this is what life is in the city. I just can't get over how you use space. Every little closet, every little corner. Nothing goes to waste in the city of New York. Wow. It's wonderful to be in the city. But sisters and brothers, ladies and gentlemen, I, I like the, 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 the story that, that, that said that the, 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 the boy was the old story that the preachers used to tell uh, about the boy who was on the sidewalk waiting for the bus. 
And a man walking told the boy that, look, son, if you want to get on the bus, you have to stand over that sign. But the boy decided he was going to stand just where he is. And so, surely enough, the man was wait watching. The bus came, stopped just where the young boy was, picked him up. And as he stepped in the door, he looked back at the man and he said, Sir, my daddy is the driver. My daddy is the driver of the bus. I want to say, friends, that if you belong in times like these, if Jesus is your daddy, wherever you are, when the bus comes for glory, he's going to pick you up. Yes, I want to say that we serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Help me, Holy Ghost. Yes, we serve a great God. We serve a great God who came to this earth and died on our behalf. But verse 9 of Revelation 7, John says that he saw this number that comes, as a matter of fact, John said they came from every nation, every kindred, every tongue, and people. As a matter of fact, John said that there were so many that he could not count. And you know, there are some people who think that the 144,000 is a literal number. And I'm not going to get into that argument today, but uh, sisters and brothers, I just want to let you know that, that John said he heard. If you go back and read it, John said, I heard 144,000. But then he says, when I looked, I saw a numberless number. Infinity. That's what John saw. Let me illustrate it this way. You know, when our four parents were called, they didn't have the goose down comforters and electric blankets that we have today, but God taught them to take the old patches or mismatched materials they call remnants. And they would sew them together and make a quilt. You see, quilt making is the art of taking stuff that appears to be useless and no good and making it into something dynamic and beautiful. If you take a quilt apart, it looks like unrelated pieces of cloth. When it's put together, what appear to be disharmonious suddenly becomes a spectacle of perfect beauty. All I'm trying to say is that one day, God is going to take the remnants of his people, some of us who appear to be useless and no good, and God will gather us together and he will bring them from the east and from the west and all nations, tribe and tongue and people. And God is going to gather us around the throne. That will be what John saw. A great multitude. A huge crowd. Somebody says that the largest football games in America, there is 102,000 people. Somebody said in China, the largest estimated number of people at a shopping mall is 1.07 million. The largest number of protesters are seen in Egypt, in, the, in Cairo, in the Arab Spring, 30 million. All over the world, people gather in large crowds for many purposes, but they are insignificant in comparison to this number that John saw. One of my favorite writers described the scene this way. One pulse of harmony and gladness will beat throughout the vast creation. From him who created all flow light and light and gladness throughout the realms of illimitable space, from the minutest atom to the greatest world, 
all things animate and inanimate in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy will declare that God is love. There will be people from every walk of life, from every background, every clan and culture, every district and dialect, every race and rank, creed and color, age and era, God is going to gather people around God's throne. And the Bible says they sing holy, holy, holy is what the angels sing. And as the songwriter says, and I expect to help them make the courts of heaven ring. But when I sing redemption story, they will fold their wings. For angels never felt the joy that our salvation brings. But here's the mystery, the mysterious and exciting part of the crowd. That the crowd is so large that no man can count them. See, John is bereft of any number. See, Pythagoras is considered to be one of the greatest mathematicians known for the Pythagoras theorem. But John said, come here, Pythagoras, help me count. Pythagoras says, I can't count them. Isaac Newton is honored as the inventor of modern calculus, but he could not count them. Euclid of Alexander is considered the father of geometry, but he could not count them. Because they are like the sand of the sea. They are Abraham's seed. Too many to number. And the Bible says in Galatians that they that are of Christ are Abraham's seed indeed. That means that all of us who accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, we are children of Abraham. That's why there are going to be some Jamaican Jews, some St. Vincent Jews, some Barbadian Jews, some Trinidadian Jews, some African Jews, some European Jews. There are going to be some American Jews, Jews from all over the world. Children of Abraham. They that are of Christ are Abraham's seed indeed. But you see, sisters and brothers, the Bible says that John looked and, and, and one of the elders asked John, and John says, who are these? And John didn't pretend like he graduated from Columbia or one of those top universities in New York. He just said, thou knowest. I'm not going to guess. I know that I don't know. And they come, the songwriter says, from the thorny path. They come from the stormy sea. They come from the hills. They come from the dales. They come now, O Lord, to thee. Arrayed in their marriage robes, their bridegroom so soon to see. He who hung upon the cross to win the victory. Who are these? These are they who have come out of great tribulation. See, I did a word study and and, and that word tribulation means grievous trouble, terrible suffering. It literally means something that presses you down and wears you out. But remember, Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. The fact of the matter is, you just have not lived long enough. If you have not experienced any kind of tribulation yet. You know, the brother talked about the pig this morning. Well, I used to hear the story about the piglet. See, the piglet would say to Mama Pig, Mama, how comes your mouth is so long? And Mama said, just keep living. Just keep on living. One day your mouth is going to grow too. All I'm saying, friends, if you haven't experienced any tribulation in life, just keep on living. Just keep on living. Life has a way of throwing 
some curve balls. Life has a way of throwing some, some, some cogs in our wheels. That's why David said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You know, I once saw this movie on the Discovery Channel uh, that called The Beer. It's the story of a baby beer whose mother died in an accident right at the beginning of the movie, and immediately you begin to wonder what's going to happen to Baby Bear when all of a sudden comes out of the woods this huge Kodiak grizzly bear. And he adopts Baby Bear, and they started life together. He taught him how to live, how to fish in the stream, how to dig for insects, how to scratch himself against the trees, and Baby Bear does everything he sees Big Bear do. But as the movie continues, they get separated, and Baby Bear is on his own. And what Baby Bear did not know was that since his mother died, a mountain lion was tracking him, waiting for a moment like this. And as the movie continues, they met face to face across the stream from each other, and the mountain lion is ready to pounce all of a sudden on Baby Bear, and Baby Bear was so scared he did what he thought Big Bear would do in a moment like this. He got up on his hind paws, put his little front paws in the air, and he tried to roar, but nothing came but a little squeak. Because Baby Bear didn't have his voice yet. And so the camera zoomed out to uh, the lion who had a look of absolute terror in his eyes, and suddenly he began to move backwards and run away. The camera goes back to Baby Bear, who is standing there looking surprised. That his little squeak was so effective. But at that moment, the camera backs up further so you can see the big picture. And what you see is what the baby bear could not see. Just a couple feet behind him was the big Kodiak giant bear. Standing on his hind legs, his paws up. And the reason that the lion ran away is that baby bear was never by himself. The big bear was always a couple of steps behind him. He couldn't see him. He couldn't hear him. Couldn't smell him. Couldn't feel him. But big bear was always there. Can I talk to some baby bears today? I want to tell you, friends, you are never alone. You don't have to be afraid. There is a big bear standing behind and nothing can separate you from his love. Yes, he said, I will never leave you. I will never abandon you. I will never forsake you. When your mother and your father forsake you, I will be with you until the end of the age. Help me, Holy Ghost. Uh, but this passage also goes on talking about struggles my friends John said he saw a numberless number these are the children of God the Bible says they came out of great tribulation gone through some trouble and I'm telling you, some of you, I said it last night, some of you probably sitting right here are anxious today because of the new immigration ban and, and stuff that is happening. I said that today, sisters and brothers, as, as I'm standing here, that one of my elders is leaving, gone to Canada. This, my friend, trouble. But God has promised that whatever 
trouble you're going through, victory is assured. Trouble cannot stop the march of faith. Problems cannot destroy the progress of God's people. Trouble and crisis may delay you, but it can't stop you. You see, we serve an anyhow God. We will make it anyhow. You can do it anyhow. Trouble is only the fuel and the energy in the tank of human motivation. It is fire in your furnace of purification. Trouble won't melt you. It will mature you. If trouble don't crush you, it will confirm you. You have got to put trouble inside of an oyster. Irritate it internally before it will make a beautiful pearl. You've got to crush a rose petal before it will release the sweet aroma of a wonderful perfume. We cannot make it without trouble. God will take us through trouble. I am not afraid of trouble because I have lived long enough to look trouble in the face and say, come on, trouble. Do your work. Have your way, trouble. I'm a child of God. Trouble, you can't destroy me. Trouble, you can't defeat me. Trouble, the more you rob me, the brighter I shine. Trouble, the more you stay on me, the longer I pray. Trouble, the more you stay on me, the better I work. Trouble, the more you hold me down, the higher I will rise. Trouble, the more you rub me, the better I preach. Trouble, have you ever seen the righteous forsaken? Trouble, have you ever seen? His seed begging bread. Trouble, look at the sparrows. They neither toil nor spin. Not even Solomon in all his glory was like one of these. So when life gets tough, sisters and brothers, friends, go with it. You know, I can remember uh, this sister who baptized in one of the meetings. And she came to church, and she was looking so fine. She had on her hat, the dress, the shoes, the bag, everything. She just looked like a New Yorker. <laughs> but when that sister gave her testimony, and she said what she did before Christ, she used to be on the street, she used to go and beg. Every day she'd be out there begging. But she says, that day when I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, I woke up the next morning and I said, I will not go out and beg because my father owns the cattle upon a thousand hills. And she said, God, you are my provider. God, you are my source. And I'm going to be depending on you. And I'm telling you, Oprah had nothing on her. She was looking good. Because God takes care of God's own. But you got to prove God for yourself. You see, faith is trusting God for your own testimony. God will tailor-made and fix your testimony for you. And that's why I tell every Christian, every Christian should prepare their testimony. What your life was like before Jesus and what your life is now. And look what God has done for you. I'm telling you, if you start counting your blessing, you'll run out of numbers. 
If you start singing your blessing, you'll run out of song. If you were going to paint your blessing, you'd have run out of paint and canvas because God is good. I don't know about you, but God has been good to me. God has been good to me. And I am not ashamed to declare his praises that God woke me up this morning, started me on my way, took me out of the bushes, out of the banana country, and gave me a place. Thank God for Jesus. I don't know about it, but I got a lot to give God thanks for. God has been good to me. I can't complain. As a matter of fact, the, the only thing I can complain is that I need to lose some weight. But God is good. You know, one more thing John said about this people. John said they have washed. They have washed their robes in the blood and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They wash their robes. Their words, robes were washed. This, this, this washed means to redeem, cleansing, forgiveness, reconciliation. All of this was completed on the cross when all of our sins, both past, present, and future, was taken away. Praise to the Lamb of Calvary. Wash their robes. See no spotted robes will be in heaven. Hence before they got there, their robes were washed. Yes, their robes were marred and scarred by the residue of sin, but their robes were spotted and stained by the dust of immorality, but their robes were marked. And thank God, there's discolored and disdained robes that Jesus washed them clean. I didn't do that in my science class, and I can't explain that for you. But one thing I can say, just like how those cows that we used to milk, a cow eats green grass and give white milk, that's how Jesus can take our, our robes and wash them in blood and they come out white. God can do the impossible. I'm telling you, friends, God can do the impossible. Have you ever asked God for the impossible? Prove God. All I'm trying to say, put God to the test. If you have never put God to the test, try him. I tell you last night, and I'll say it again, I've been baptized since I was nine years old, and God has been good to me. I'm in my 50s now. And God has been good to me. If you trust God and God fail you, you come and tell me I will never call his name again. God can do anything but fail. Put God to the test. Sisters and brothers, friends, I'm saying you can trust God. If you can't find anybody else you can trust, trust God. And the truth is, friends, that sometimes the trust that we're putting in human beings, we ought to put in God. There's some things only God and you should know. You don't tell them to nobody else. You trust God. I'm telling you, God can do the impossible. I'm telling you, God can do the impossible. I told you last night what happened in Boston. We have friends here from Boston. I'm not lying. Sisters and brothers, I'm saying that we had water in the roof at the church. And we didn't have the money to repair. I said, God, what are we going to do? I told the congregation, we need $15,000. And some, that, no, no, that was 10000 in Boston. And somebody wrote a check right sitting in the congregation for $10,000. The work was done. 
Well, I went to another church. Elder Palmer is here, Brockton. And those folks in Brockton, I didn't think they were as rich as the folks in Boston. But we needed money. I said it again. We needed funds. I don't know who it is to this day, but somebody went out and got a cashier's check for $14,000 and put it in the plate. What I'm saying, friends, I've seen God work in time and time again. And I'm just trying to say this just to say that this is just money, monetary wise. When you thought that the people you're serving, you don't see them with that kind of money, but God prepared and provided. But I'm saying there are other ways that God opened doors. For us, when you trust God, your children to go to school, to go to college, and you don't have that money, but you trusted God and said, go in faith. God will take care of you. I like that hymn, number 99 in the hymnal. God will take care of you. And I'm saying, but you got to trust God. And if you trust him, but I like what John said. John said, I saw the crowd and they were shouting blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be into our God forever and ever. Amen. You know, the songwriter says, I've had my share of up and down. Times when there was no one around. But God came and spoke in words to me. Praise will confuse the enemy. Praise him. Praise him. In good times, praise him. Praise him. When things are going wrong, praise God. When things are going good, praise God. Is there anybody in here today that... God has done something for you and you can say praise God. Praise him in advance. I've had my ups and downs. Regardless of what life dumps on us here on earth, when we get to heaven, we'll be laughing and shouting and praising God. The Bible says, the Bible says that they were having a party. They were singing and shouting and worshiping. Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might. Be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Uh, you know, in closing, I just want to say, friends, that there was an old lady who died at church, a senior citizen. I like to say seasoned citizen. She passed, but her request was that in her casket, she wanted a utensil, a fork or a spoon in her hand. And she wanted everybody who came to the front to view her remains to see that utensil. And when they asked, why is she holding that utensil in her hand? The explanation is that when we have the potlucks that we have at church on Sabbath, and we share those sumptuous delicacies and we eat the meal, sometimes the saints would say, hold on to your utensil. Hold on to your fork because the best is yet to come. The dessert is coming. And so hold on to your fork. She wanted this fork in her hand because she wanted everybody who came to see that the best is yet to come. Hold on, my friends. The best is yet to come. Yes, John said, I saw the church in the antediluvian world washed away by a flood, but God had his church locked in a boat. Seven members. 
and the preacher called Noah locked in the boat. I saw the church captive in Egypt. The Bible says making bricks out of straw. But thank God after 400 years of struggle in Egypt, God rose up Moses in the desert and sent him down to tell old Pharaoh, let my people go. John said, I see the church in the wilderness. The church in the lion's den and fiery furnace behind prison bars, whipped and intimidated, thrown in a pot of boiling oil, beguiled, beheaded, betrayed. But thank God, God's church will triumph. I've seen the church put on a Roman cross, locked in the tomb. Somebody said it's Friday, but Sunday was a come. Yes, the church was locked in the tomb and Satan had some of his angels down there and he called down there and he said, how is it? They said, Master, we have him covered. He's dead. He's dead. Saturday, call down there. They said, Master, he's still covered. But the Bible says that it began to dawn towards the first day of it seemed like Gabriel came out of heaven so fast, faster than the inconceivable velocity of light or sound. And Gabriel came down to the tomb. And maybe Gabriel was traveling so fast that he, he didn't put out his wings to put on some brakes. And Gabriel hit the ground so hard that the Bible says there was an earthquake. And the stone was removed out of place. And Gabriel pitched it away as a marble. And he said, Jesus, your father, has called thee. Thank God my Jesus got up out of that tomb. Put away those grove clothes. Look back at death and said, oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? I am the resurrection and the life. Yes, my friend, Jesus has the keys of hell. Jesus got the keys of death. Jesus got the keys to the grave. We don't have to fear death. We don't have to fear the grave. We don't have to fear hell because the church is marching on. But the question for you, my friends, is are you marching with God's church today. Thank God. There's some of us here. Who have decided. To go all the way with Jesus. Yeah Dr. Robinson tell me. That there's some souls here. Who have decided to be baptized today. Praise God. And I'm telling you friends. I've learned the meaning of the text. That there is joy in heaven. Over one. When you get one in America. You got to give thanks. I've lived in places where I've seen hundreds baptized for a year. But in America, when I get one, I said to the deacon, fill the pool. We praise God. The Bible says there is joy in heaven. That's a party. Heaven has a party over one. Sisters and brothers, friends, we ought to rejoice when we get one. Because God is God all by God's self. And so I want to say today, choose ye whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But John says, I saw that innumerable number, infinity. I like that. Because it's much larger than 144,000. There is hope that all of us can make it in into God's kingdom. But the truth is, sisters and brothers, it's only by the grace of God. It's only by God's amazing grace. It's grace that calls us, as that sister saying, the grace of God. It's called us. The grace of God can keep us from falling. The grace of God 
will carry us victorious until Jesus comes. Is there somebody today who want to accept the grace of God today? Somebody, as we pray, is there somebody you've never given God a chance in your life? But you want to say, Pastor, today, by God's grace, I want to serve Jesus. We just want to hold this. We're going to have the baptism, but we want to hold the appeal. Would you stand with me as we pray? There may be somebody. Just stand with me as we pray. There may be somebody. You just want to say, Pastor, please pray for me today. I invite you to come down front. Let the devil know that you want to be in that great number. You want to walk down here? I want to pray for you. I want to shake your hand and pray for you today. Is there one? You want to come on down so we can pray together? Never given Jesus a chance in your life, but you want to come today. Oh, praise God. Somebody coming to Jesus today. Come while there is hope. We want to hold for 30 seconds. Is there one? 25 seconds to come to Jesus. 24 seconds, praise God. Is there one for Jesus? 20 seconds. 19, 15 seconds. We don't want to wear out the saints, but somebody need to come to Jesus in Grand Concourse today. Oh, praise God. 10 seconds. Start walking. I'll wait for you. Nine seconds. Eight seconds. Seven seconds. Five seconds. Four seconds. Is there one for Jesus? Three seconds. Two seconds. Is there one? Oh, praise God. Shall we pray, Father? We thank you for your word today. God, we know that you said in your word that your word will not come back to you void. And so, God, we thank you for uh, this wonderful congregation you have in Grand Concourse. I pray, O oh God, that your blessing and your anointing will continue to be in this place. Lord, we pray that the ministry of Dr. Robinson will continue to be so fruitful in this place that they will have to have multiple services to accommodate the people. God, we long for that day when we will see that victorious throng, when the church militant will become the church triumphant. We pray and we thank you for hearing us because we ask it in the wonderful name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen and amen.